Good morning, good morning. Uh, a few people are still joining, but uh, thanks everyone for coming to this uh, session. It's a cold day, but it's sunny. Um, we'll get on with it. Uh, welcome to this month's public meeting of the United Nations Association, Harpenden. We are privileged to have a, as a guest speaker, Sir Tony Brenton, uh, who's gonna be uh, talking to us uh, on, on a, a talk entitled Russia Sharing the Cage with an Angry Bear. The talk will last about 40 minutes or so. It'll be followed by a Q&A for another half an hour. Uh, after the Q&A, you're welcome to join us for refreshments next door. Continue your discussions. Uh, we're very grateful for any voluntary contributions you may have made or can make. Contrib contributions can be made in cash or by credit card at the table near, near the entrance door. We have this place till 12.30 p.m. Uh, and we need to vacate it by then through the back door entrance. For those who have booked a place for lunch at Pasta Chibo, we'll be leaving at 12.15. Um, if I may uh, ask for a show of hands of people who are coming to us at Pasta Chibo, uh, Derek Sagar Sumaria, Okay, Tony, um, anybody else? Phillips, uh, Jerome Philip? Yeah, I can see Jerome. Uh, we'll, we'll gather you together at 12.15 and then head towards Pastor Chief. There are some chairs in the front, Philip. If you don't know who we are, my name is Suhel Sharyar. I'm the uh, chair of UNA Harpenden. Uh, our community group was formed in 1947 and we cover Harpenden, St. Albans, and the surrounding villages. We are linked with UNA UK, which is a national body and a charity that lobbies MPs and peers on issues related to the UN. Our purpose is to raise awareness by campaigning uh, awareness on the United Nations, by campaigning on peace, humanitarian, social, and environmental issues, once a year, we formulate policy resolutions on global issues and send them to the Foreign and Commonwealth Development Office for comment, and they do comment. We hold regular public meetings with talks given by guest speakers from universities, NGOs, and UN agencies. Talks like these are free to attend, and there is no joining or membership fees. You're free to pick and choose. We have an AGM and a committee that's elected in April or May, should anyone have an interest in joining us. Our next event after today is a social event with a, a quiz and a fish and chip supper uh, at the Park Hall on December 9th. We have a newsletter and a website. Uh, please feel free to check out recordings of past talks or read our constitution and history. And to subscribe to our newsletter, please leave your name and address in the attendance sheet being passed around. Now to our guest speaker. Sir Tony Brenton, KCMG, is a former UK ambassador to Russia. He served for over 30 years with the British Foreign Service, including postings in the Middle East, the European Union, Washington DC, and Russia. He was in charge of the British Embassy in Washington through the Iraq War, and was British ambassador to Russia 2004 to 2008. He has been a UK negotiator on global climate change and the International Criminal Court. He has published two books, The Greening of Machiavelli on International Environmental Politics and Historically Inevitable on the Russian Revolution. He is now a fellow at Wolfson College, Cambridge, a senior fellow at the Cambridge Department of Politics and International Studies, and a regular commentator and contributor on international affairs, notably on Russia. 
So without further ado, Sir Tony Brenton. Thank you very much for that warm greeting. It's always a mistake to clap before. It's like paying for a restaurant meal before you've actually tasted the food. Save the applause if indeed you still feel like doing it at the end. And, and thank you very much, actually. It's a lovely day out there. I arrived half an hour before I came into this hall. We took, took a little walk around your beautiful town. And um, I have to say, every town which has an excellent bookshop, which yours does, stands quite high on my list of estimation. Uh, unfortunately, however, my subject is Russia. Uh, and before I get into the rimness of it, um, I, I'd like to tell you a little joke by way of warning that, that well, I'll tell you what the warning is in a minute. But the story is that a, a, a great statesman is approaching the end of his life, and he's done lots of hard work in international politics, and an angel appears to him and says to him, Sir, you've done a lot for mankind. We up there would like to do something for you. So the statesman thinks for a bit and says, Well, okay. I've done far too much air travel, particularly across the Atlantic. I would like a road, please, so I can get to America on the road. And the angel looks a bit crestfallen and says, um, well, actually, what we had in mind was something more, more spiritual, more intellectual, as, as the sort of reward which you would appreciate. So the statesman thinks again and says, well, all right, then. I've spent a lot of my career dealing with Russia. Please explain Russia to me. And the angel again looks crestfallen and then says, what kind of bridge would you like, Roland? <laughs> People who purport to know about Russia are basically all con men, including me, actually. I was with Churchill who described Russia as a riddle wrapped inside a mystery inside an enigma. And it, over my, I spent quite a lot of time in Russia, it got weirder and weirder and weirder as time wore on. And sadly, that's a bit of the background to the story I'm about to tell um, that there's been presumptions in important places, notably Washington, D.C., where I spent a chunk of my career, that the Russians were just like us. They would knuckle under and accept whatever we intended to do, which sadly has not proven to be the case. Anyway, let's start by just looking at Russia. There it is. Um, so 11 time zones, seventh of the, of the world's surface. What that map is, is, is actually a map of the expansion of Russia. As you, as you move east and indeed slightly west and so on, what you're looking at piece by piece how Russia has accumulated in such a vast area. Between the years of uh, 1612 and 1917, it expanded at the rate of 55 square miles a day. So you can understand that Russia's neighbors have lived with a certain amount of nervousness over the course of history as this vast great thing has expanded around them. And I'm we're obviously gonna come back to Ukraine because that's the big current issue with Russia. And slightly, I have to say, occluded by what's going on in the Middle East now, another area where I have a lot of interest and in, in friends, which we, I will come to briefly at the end. Anyway, just to talk about, you know, look at Russian expansion and how fast and how vast they have expanded. If you look at the particular case of Ukraine, um, well, I, first of all, I should say back in, in 1067, about then, a place called U uh, Kievan Rus, centered on Kiev, the current capital of Ukraine, was a sort of Camelot, everyone remembers it as a great gathering of the Eastern lands of, of, of Europe, the, the, the home of Slavism, the home of Orthodox Christianity, all of that. Um, centered, as I say, in, in old, in old um, um, Kiev, in, in old Ukraine, it collapsed in the face of the Mongol invasion, leaving a sort of Cossack core to Ukraine, which uh, looked around the world. And as it looked around the world, what it saw was to its, um, to its west, the, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, so-called, busily eating up everything around it. To its south, the Ottoman Empire, also busily eating up everything around it. And to its east, the Russian Empire. And it had to choose between those three options if it would survive at all. And in Perislavl in 1654, a man, a, a Cossack called Bogdan Kmielinovich, swore allegiance to the Russian Tsar, which in in, at least in the eyes of a lot of Ukrainians, subsequently it was a big mistake because the Russian Tsar then proceeds, as you can see in this map down here, to basically eat up all of Ukraine as they see off the Ottomans to the south and see off the Poles to, to the west. So there you have the Cossack bit, the little yellow bit in the middle there. Um, the Russians pick up the green bit of, up above it, pick that up in the course of expanding, taking over from Poland to Lithuania. They also pick up the southern stuff from the Ottomans, which is only attached to Ukraine. Um, when the communists take over in 1922, and not all of it. Crimea, right down the bottom there, 
is hung on to by the Russians because there's this great sentimental attachment from Russia to Crimea. It's like the only place reasonably close where you can go and get a decent day's sunshine. Um, they actually hung on to it until 1954, when it, was hand, yeah, when it was handed over to Ukraine as a result of an obscure deal done in the Politburo, probably late at night after too much vodka. Um, which, and it didn't matter because at that time, Ukraine and Russia were both parts of the Soviet Union, and therefore shifting bits about didn't really make all the difference. The extreme Western part over there was only picked up by Stalin, actually, at the end of the Second World War, and remains fervently and nationalistically Ukrainian, um, and has therefore been a source of a lot of anti Russianism, which is mostly in Ukraine sense. But what you ended up with for a while was Ukraine more or less split down the middle between a, an eastern half, which was Russian speaking essentially, and very oriented towards Russia, and a western half, which was very Ukrainian nationalist, and on the whole was western looking and felt its links more with Western Europe. And that's no longer the case, of course, the Ukrainians have gathered very firmly in defense of Ukraine's um, uh, defense now. But that fissure for a long time ran through Ukraine's uh, political geography and was quite a lot of what was behind Putin's decision to invade. He, he anticipated, frankly, that the whole eastern half would fall very quickly into Russia's arms, which is exactly what didn't happen. We'll come back to that. Okay, I'm going to move away from Ukraine now for quite a long time and talk more about Russia more generally. And I'm going to offer you three lessons from Russian history, which give you some insight into the way the country works. And there will be a little test question in due course, so brace yourselves. First point is Russian uniqueness. So, you know, we, the Russians, have been very important, indeed crucial, in world history. Don't you forget it. The second is a very ambivalent attitude to the West. We tend to view Russia as a rather dark neighbor who on the whole we have been nice to and have done the whole they've not reciprocated. And the third point to watch is that as Russian history has proceeded, so at regular intervals, they have had to turn to a strong leader to hold the country together and stand up against the country's enemies. So to take them, these in order, Russian uniqueness, and you shoot three blokes. This guy up here, Philip Fairs of Pskov, was a, um, uh, a monk in a, in a, in a monastery in, in Moscow quite early on, 15, 20 or so. And he enunciated the so-called doctrine of the third row. Point being that Constantinople had fallen to the Ottomans in 1453. Therefore, Moscow had emerged as the biggest center of Orthodox Christianity as the world rolled on. And in the eyes, of course, of Orthodox Christians, that meant that they held the key to mankind's salvation. Catholicism was heresy. Protestantism was heresy. Islam was obviously a heresy. It's the key. You, if you lead Orthodoxy, then you are the leader of the human race towards salvation. And um, what uh, Philotheus said, in fact, and he said, well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the words. The Tsar is on earth, the sole emperor of the Christians, the leader of the apostolic church, which stands no longer in Rome, or Constantinople, the second Rome, or Constantinople, but in the blessed city of Moscow. She alone shies, shines in the whole world brighter than the sun. Two Romes have fallen, that's Rome and Constantinople. The third stands, and a fourth there shall not be. We are the climax of uh, civilization, the great hope for mankind, and you know, you, you therefore be nice to us because we are, we are the leaders of mankind in the future. This rather well, messianic view of, of Russia's role in human history to some extent repeated by Tsar Alexander I, who's the Tsar in charge when Napoleon invaded Russia, defeated him. The Russians had the feeling that they'd saved all of Western civilization from this barbaric Frenchman. Um, and um, therefore, Alexander said, my role, my country's role is to save mankind. It's a repetition of the Third Rome Doctrine 400 years later, 300 years later. And a further repetition in this weirdly distorted form, was Lenin arrives, takes over Russia in 1917 um, as the representative, as the believer in a vast utopian creed, Marxist, Leninism, communism, which again was going to save mankind, which was going to bring prosperity, bring history to an end, all of that. And on reflection, knowing what you do about Russia, knowing what I do about Russia, it is not, if, if, if this creed, this ludicrous creed as it turned out, was going to work anywhere, it was going to work in a country which is already obsessed 
with its own leading role in the history of mankind. Okay, so that's the first point. Russia th thought of itself and still thinks of itself as central, the key point in the way mankind is going to go. The second issue was attitude to the West. And the attitude to the West is basically built on the Russian historical experience that every hundred years or so, some Western power invades it with a view to destroying it completely. So I'll introduce you to these invaders. Sigismund of Poland, 1610, sweeps in, occupies Moscow, tries to impose Catholicism, heresy, tries to impose it, um, and eventually is, is booted out by, actually by the Russian peasantry, usually. Charles XII, King of Sweden, now, Sweden in those days was not the nice vegetarian Scandinavian state that it is now. It was a major military power, the normal expansionist ambitions that major military powers have. It wants to get rid of actually Peter I, who was the emperor of Moscow, of Russia at the time. Sweeps in, gets a long way, and then halfway, actually in the middle of Ukraine, a place called Poltava, is stopped by Peter, defeated, forced back. And that is the moment actually when Russia emerges as a key player in the European game of politics. Third man you will know, big film just out, Napoleon rolls in in 1812 with a view again to suppressing Russia. His view of the Russians was scratch a Russian and you'll find a Tatar. Um, occupies Moscow, burns it down. If you haven't read War and Peace, well, reading War and Peace, which is quite long, it's, it's, not compulsory, it's, compulsory, it's not compulsory, but the recent BBC series, not that recent now, captures the atmosphere very much. Now they said he's defeated, driven back, um, and left Alexander I and the Russians, feeling, as I say, we are the saviors of Europe, and the Europeans don't recognize it. And then a bit late, these are roughly 100 year intervals, a bit late, Hitler in 1941 turns up with the most barbaric, genocidal invasion of anyone ever. 26 million Russians die in the course of the Second World War at a fought out on the Eastern Front. We congratulate ourselves on having won it, and we contributed. The Americans congratulate themselves on, on having, having won it, and they contributed. But the real war and the real victory took place on the Eastern Front in appalling conditions. Um, and again, they, they, you know, the, Russians, the Russians won, were expecting thanks and, and all that from the rest of the human race, at least from Europeans, and feel very strongly that they haven't got it. Again, what they view, not without justice, is they played <coughs> An absolutely crucial role in saving um, in saving Western civilization. Okay, that's the second point. Then invaders of Russia regularly every hundred years, someone pops up from the West. My third point: the need for a strong leader. So I'm going to introduce you to a string of people with whom, on the whole, you would not want to have dinner. These are not nice people. They are tough people who, who turned up at regular intervals as Russia needed them. So Ivan the Fourth, better known as Ivan the Terrible. Um, ruled Russia in the middle of the 16th century, murdered his son in a drunken fit, um, but established Russian control over the whole Volga River Valley, and therefore established the basis for all of the expansion that took place since. Peter the Great, I've already mentioned, uh, turns up in the, in the beginning of the 18th century, actually recognizes that by this stage, Europe is moving ahead in technological and in other ways, military ways. He says, so he sends all his aristocracy out to learn uh, mathematics and things in European courts. Actually, it's rather nice, nice aside. Um, he, he introduced a rule that young Russian aristocrats could not get married until they passed uh, an examination in mathematics, which I feel rather strongly is rather a good idea, speaking as an ex-mathematician myself. Anyway, um, he, and he said of the West, first we will learn from the West, and then expurgating only slightly, we will show them our backsides. But defeated Charles XII and moved the capital, window on the west, St. Petersburg, uh, and set about modernizing Russia in a way which people say, you know, China fell under Western influence, India fell under Western influence. The thing that kept Russia out of that is Peter, who, who charted Russia's own course. Third person up there, Catherine II, middle of the 18th century, not actually Russian at all. A minor German princess who married well, she married the heir to the Russian throne, a uh, very unpleasant man. Eventually, um, the Empress Elizabeth, who was the mother of the heir, um, dies. Catherine very quickly murders the heir, takes over as, um, uh, as Empress of Russia. She's a German. She's very keen on organizing the place, on making it function in a decent European way. 
She tries to introduce some form of constitutional government. She tries to introduce some form of consultation with the people. None of it works. It doesn't work. You don't, Russians look up, seek authority from above. Towards the end of her life, with a great sigh, she said, I will be an autocrat. That is my fate. The good Lord will forgive me. That is his. Um, and um, tried to do a lot, but ruled finally with an iron hand. Nicholas I, you probably don't know much about him, Tsar in the middle of the 19th century, became known as the Sergeant Major of Europe in the middle of the 19th century. There was a big outburst of revolution actually in the center of Europe, as lots of countries tried to become more democratic. It was Nicholas who wandered around Europe, sending his troops along to put down the revolution and make sure that autocracy remained as extensive as possible. And then Lenin and Stalin, I don't need to say anything. They come along, they introduce the creed, um, and the creed, the problem with the creed, I mean, all of the visions are very attractive. The idea of from each according to his ability to each according to his need, all of that, socializing all of the means of production. You can see why it would win young people over. I have a couple of young people in my family and they're all, they're all naive, really. Hang on to your old men, hang on to people like me. Anyway, it's a, you know, it's a very attractive sounding creed and I've been to a lot of other countries where it also applied. And the way it goes everywhere is inevitable. If the economic power of the state, then political power falls into the hands of the state. What you end up is with totalitarianism and an awful lot of people in gulags and, uh, and, and uh, purges, which is exactly, of course, what happened to these two. And I, just, I should warn you, by the way, people say, well, Lenin was a good guy. You know, he was out there, he was trying to do the creed. It was Stalin who was the real oppressor. That is wrong. Lenin introduced a lot of the techniques, the Red Terror, all of that, which Stalin simply drew on in a much more gruesome way. So the Russian habit, as I say, is to um, produce an autocrat when it needs one, tough ruler. And there's the, 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 there they are in all of Russian history. I'm now gonna jump 200 years ahead to this man, Mikhail Gorbachev, whom I saw quite a lot of Russian when I was in Moscow. Towards the end of, the end of communism, we're talking the 1980s, we're talking the time when communism quite plainly did not work. Uh, the, the economy was falling dramatically behind the rate with which we were advancing in the West. Gorbachev, who was a true believer in Marxism and all of that, um, wanted to make it work. And in order to make it work, he set about reforming it. He thought on the edges, just marginally. Okay, we'll let the press be a little bit freer. We'll let people have minor private enterprises to get private enterprise going. This is a bit like introducing a virulent virus into an already very decayed economic and political structure. And the whole house of cards comes down, Perestroika, Glasnost, all of that leads to social chaos, leads to economic collapse, leads first of all to the so-called external empire, East Germany, Poland, Czechoslovakia, all of them, break, seize the opportunity to break away and then collapse in the Soviet Union itself. This is Moscow, August 19th, 1991, followed an attempted military coup. The man standing on the tank is, of course, Yeltsin, who inherits Russia from, from Gorbachev. Gorbachev is swept away in, in, in his first exchange, um, saying to the people, saying to the army, army, go back to your barracks. People, we're going to get rid of all this stuff and move on in a good way. It works. One of the reasons why it works is what you can't see in that picture is that underneath where the tanks are, there are various, but some people I know who are wandering around dishing out $100 bills to the troops in the tank saying, take, take the money and, and disappear. So the coup collapses, and that is followed then by the, the USSR as a whole collapsing, splitting up into 15 individual um, states. Russia still are by a long way the biggest, but a lot of others, and we will come back to Ukraine, which at this point becomes, becomes an independent state. And you're, you're in a country now which is in a state of total domestic collapse. The economy is collapsed, um, order on the streets is collapsing, the mafia are taking over, over the streets. The army, at one point, the electricity goes off in, uh, the, 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 in, in Russia's nuclear advance warning headquarters. It, it is, I was there for a bit, I was there from 94 to 98, and it was terrible. And one of the things I remember from the time, I'll show you a picture from it. One of the things I remember from the time is you, you, there were no babies. People were so depressed, you never saw people pushing babies around in cramps. People had other better things to do or just didn't like the, the feeling of the future enough to bring new people into it. And you saw at this point, a great disruption, uh, division in the way Russia worked. That scene was visible from my office window. 
I was there the first time as economic councillor, which is lots of old ladies, Babushki, gathering outside Moscow's biggest station, the Kiev station, to sell their most prized possessions, their um, copies of Pushkin, their photograph frames, which had had their families and all that, in order to buy bread. And that was the low end, and that was the vast majority of the Russian people were completely impoverished and immiserated by the economic collapse. But a handful of people, the so-called oligarchs, spotted what was going on, spotted the opportunity to acquire chunks of the Russian economy. Not always illegal, I'll tell you the story. I'm taking far too long with this nice little story. Because how they did it was they dished out so-called privatization coupons to the whole population, which were then produced to bid in auctions for chunks of the Russian economy. A friend of mine, I was at that time, owned a motorbike. I should say these privatization coupons, for most people, is the piece of paper from government, obviously useless. So they threw it away or used it to paper the smallest room in the house or sold it to some passing hoodlum. Now, my friend wasn't a hoodlum, but he did own a motorbike. He did see there were opportunities for property. He sold his motorbike, went around all his respectable neighbors buying their, uh, their, 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 their vouchers for copecks, but he, you know, copeck is a copeck is a copeck comes away with a wheelbarrow full of privatization vouchers, goes off the auction and comes out of the auction with a machine tool factory with 10,000 employees. That's what you could do. You turn your motorbike into a vast industrial combine. So a handful of people, at one point, half a dozen bankers owned half the Russian economy, really make it uh, fantastically well. And that doesn't make for very healthy politics, of course. The gap between the oligarchs on the one hand and the, uh, the impoverished the majority on the other. So that also is, is a great source of tension and, and anger at what's going on. And the third thing, um, which is really worrying for Russians, is that it looks as if like, the country has already split up into the 15 republics. It now looks as if Russia is going to collapse further. And in particular, Chechnya, which is part of the, the badlands of Russia down in the, down in the Caucasus, very, Muslim, very Islamic, very, um, you know, Islamism is spreading there as it is in lots of other places at the same time. It says, we want to be independent. Russians send the army in. The Russian army is defeated by the Chechens. And for a while, it looks as if Chechnya is going to go, then Tatarstan is going to go. But Russia itself is going to break up into, I don't know, half a dozen other republics. So lots of weakness, lots of economic problems, real political chaos on the streets, the hated oligarchs at the top of all this. And at this point, to Russian eyes, it begins to look as if the West are beginning to take advantage of their weakness. And one of the major things we do at this time is we expand NATO. Now, NATO, of course, the alliance which held us, defended us effectively through the Cold War. Lots of talk at the end of it, we don't need it anymore. Europe, peace from Vancouver to Vladivostok, uh, you know, the, the new, new world order and all of that stuff, um, which the Russians bought, and which I thought that we bought, I have to say. Um, but you've got the, the Czechs, you've got the Poles, remember the 55 square miles a, a, a year expansion, a day expansion, um, saying, look at this, you know, Russia's still vast, it's still dangerous, let us into NATO, defend us for God's sake. And Clinton, after some havering, essentially infuriates the Russians by saying, oh, okay, we need the Polish votes uh, in Chicago, for example. So we then... I mean, if you look at this map, the bright green, the lurid green bits are the old NATO. The darker green are the one, are the places that were invited in from um, the year 2000 on. And the way to look at this map is look at it from the right hand side. Look at it from the east. Look at it from Moscow. Imagine you're a Russian general looking at that and watching the quotes enemy, mainly if we're expanding NATO, then NATO is still in business, watching the, watching the enemy expand 200 miles into to your heart. And so this point that the, in particular, the, the Russian security establishment concluded they're just double-faced the West. They talk peace, but they're setting themselves up for war. George Kennan, a very famous um, observer of the, of the Soviet Union, the man who wrote the so-called Long Telegraph at the end of the Second World War, said, and he was right, the most fateful error of American policy in the entire post-Cold War era. A moment of deep um, uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for here? Uh, dis, <laughs> disenchantment within Russia, within the security establishment and elsewhere with the West. Okay, so you've got a Russia 
failed order on the streets, huge economic dissension, huge immiseration, bits of Russia sort of threatening to break off. What does Russia do when it finds itself in that sort of hole? Strong man. Strong man. Thank you. Good that someone's been listening. Thank you very much, sir. And there he is, of course. Um, he turns up, and R R Yeltsin's getting old. I saw, I saw quite a lot of him. He's no longer got it. He, he drinks too much of that. His family are very, you know, family means the immediate people around him are very, very alarmed because they've made an absolute mint out of being his family while he's been president. They're looking around, therefore, for someone who's tough. The job description is described in two words, Russia's Pinochet. We want a guy who can pull the country together, deal with the economic problems, and most particularly keep us out of jail with, with what's coming. They find Putin, who's been head of the FSB, the main security organ in Russia, who emerges out of nowhere. I mean, he, he in effect becomes, uh, moves into the pole position in November 2000, November 1999, very, very late. And then Yeltsin quits on the 31st of December, 1999. Putin takes over as president. Complete unknown, complete unknown. But from the Russian point of view, he's exactly what the doctor ordered. Now, I don't recommend to you that you adopt these techniques at home, well, depending on what your home is like. Um, but what Putin does in not very pleasant way, it gets the place under control. Chechnya, what he basically does is he bombs Grozny, the capital of Chechnya, flat, installs a very nasty dictator to run Chechnya, and suddenly Chechnya seems to, seems to be a problem for Russian unity. And seeing that, the Tatars and the others say, oh, no, we're not going to get involved in, in this. So suddenly the Russia breaking up problem vanishes from the map. Um, the oligarchs, this man down here, Mikhail Khodorkovsky, who currently lives in London, I am quite well, um, Russia's richest man. What happens is that Putin actually gets the half dozen bankers industrialists who own most of Russia together for a lunch. He says, guys, I don't want to know how you acquired your money. Um, I, you know, I expect you to support Russia now. And in particular, I'm the president. I do not expect you to involve yourself in politics. And they go away grumbling. I'm like, they've been running the country, in effect, for the last few years. Why on earth should they stop now? And in particular says, no, we're a free country now. I can use my money how I like. If I want to you know, sell my oil company to the Americans, if I want to bribe a load of people in the Duma to get the sort of deal that I want, then of course I'm free to do it. Whereupon, on a business trip to Siberia, he's pulled off his plane, plunged into a court, charged with tax evasion, completely bogus charge, and locked away for 10 years. So the other oligarchs say, oh, Mr. Putin, of course, we're not going to get involved in politics. And suddenly they, they sort of vanish from the political scene. Putin has absolute dominance. He has a problem with the press. Uh, the press are very hostile to him. Much of that is owned by oligarchs, all of it is owned by oligarchs, actually. He's very hostile to him, especially as he tries to impose the truth. This man is a guy called Boris Berezovsky, whom I also know very well, who helped Putin to get the job. He was, he was part of the family, in effect, uh, to get the job of president. Now sees that he's made a big mistake, so launches a big movement in his television station, which is the most watched television station in Russia, to push Putin out. That sign says, I created you and I will destroy you. Whereupon Berezovsky finds himself on a plane with a one-way ticket to London, where he actually lived until he died. Similar things happen to a guy called Gusinski, who ends up in Israel. And again, therefore, the press collapses. You don't disagree with Putin. You don't criticize Putin. You don't inquire into Putin's love life. You toe the line. Now, Putin is also lucky in that the, the key indicator of how well Russia is doing economically is the oil price. The oil price has been historically low under late Yeltsin, Putin takes over just the moment when it begins to shoot up. So he begins to bring a measure of economic prosperity. And his popularity with the Russian people surges. But understand, I mean, the economics helps, but there's a, they regularly used to hold polls in the Russian people about what's more important to you, freedom, Svoboda, or order, Koryadok. And regularly, by a country mile, Koryadok comes in on top. And Putin he provided it. He got rid of the mafia, got rid of the oligarchs, controlled the press, and the Russian people loved him for it. As I say, I'm not commending these techniques. I'm simply saying that they worked in the eyes of the Russian people, and he has remained very popular. The level of popularity that our politicians would die for ever since, in effect. 
but he continues to run into problems externally. To Ukraine, 2004, there was a thing called the Russian Revolution, there had been an election, um, which was relatively free, but not totally. Um, the man who wins it, who, look, who looks as if he wins it, is a man called uh, Yanukovych there. He, you remember the division of Ukraine between Russian looking East and um, uh, Western looking uh, West, and um, the, the ruling of Ukraine had kind of alternated between politicians from the two sides. Yanukovych was, in a sense, the Eastern representative in the election in 2004, and um, he thought he'd won. But then thousands of people appear on the Maidan, the main square in, in Kiev, to which we will return, protesting against the election. Yanukovych is, is a useless man, completely feeble, looks at this lot and then concedes that, yes, we should have a court cool thing again. Putin, who's backed him to the hilt through the election, and then, then of course, the court, I don't know who bought it, but the court then rules against Yanukovych. Um, and uh, another man called Yushchenko takes over. Putin was backed very visibly, Yanukovych, through this. It's a huge humiliation. Says, I'm not going to let that sort of thing happen to me again. And Putin is, is a man who, when he looks at a big crowd like that, he doesn't say, gosh, what an inspiring example of, of, of national views. What he says is, who paid them to be out there? And the answer in his head, and we'll see this again and again and again, is, of course, it was the CIA. It's the Americans who want me out. So, Stroke one against the West in our emerging relationship. How could the Americans do this in the country which the Russians, it's important to understand this, regard as their, their little brother? They're the closest country, as they look around the world, the closest country to them historically. I don't know a Russian who doesn't own a house in Ukraine, doesn't have relatives in Ukraine, all of that. Historically, socially, however, is how they view Ukraine as being very close to them. What are the Americans doing dabbling around in our backyard? Second stroke, Georgia, 2008. Now, you've no doubt read the Western newspapers about this, and what the Western newspapers say is that Russia invaded Georgia. What actually happened was that the Georgians um, attacked Russian peacekeeping troops in a small province of, um, of Georgia, and the Russians, I was in, Mos in Moscow at the time, I was sent along to protest at the Russian foreign ministry. How could you be so beastly to your Georgia? And the bloke I went to see was an old friend. He said, Tony, they fired first. And that is actually the case. You won't read it in the Western news, but it's very weird, the Western coverage of it. Anyway, so the Russians do invade Georgia in response to this vast... I can imagine Putin, somebody says to him, Georgia, the, Georgia's the tactics. He says, Georgia? Where is it? Oh, do you know. Um, what's going on? I'm not going to be insulted in this way. Go and see them off, which they do. And are then persuaded gently to come back. But as Putin asks himself, how could this absurd thing have happened? His conclusion is that the Americans must have put them up to it. The Jordans are quite close to the Americans. The main, main street from the center of Tbilisi, the capital, to the airport is called George W. George H. W. Street, and so on. Um, so again, a second strike against the, against the West, it, it, provoking the Georgians to, to insult Russia in this way. Third strike, we're now 2011, 2012. Um, I won't bore you with the political background, but there's a question about Putin returning to the presidency, having stood down for four years um, because of um, term limits. He continued to rule Russia as prime minister, but having stood down. The question of, is he going to come back now as president? Huge demonstrations. We're now in December 2011, early 2012, by the young, the urban, um, but they look as if they speak for the Russian people. They don't, but they look as if they speak for the Russian people. And that sign down there says, Russia without Putin, saying, he shouldn't come back, okay? Um, this lady up here, you will recognize, Hillary Rodham Clinton, at that time, US Secretary of State, says on public television, you should, Mr. Putin, you should give those people their political rights, like basically get out. Um, it is not a good time to hold big popular demonstrations in Moscow and Petersburg and other places in the middle of winter. So you sit it out, temperature falls to minus 20, they all go home. Um, and the demonstrations collapse and Putin does become president again. But he remembers this. He remembers Hillary Clinton. This is not a man who lets a grudge go. Uh, and he comes, we'll come back to that later. But these three things then, we've had um, uh, the, the, the Orange Revolution in Ukraine, we've had the Georgian invasion, we've had the demonstrations in Moscow backed by Hillary Clinton, leaving Putin with that view of how the United States views him and his regime and his country. 
I'm going to need to move on quite swiftly, aren't I? Um, so we go back to Ukraine. This is now 2014. At this point, there's Yanukovych is by now president, as I said, legally elected, but he is looking at a trade agreement with the EU. Putin invites him to Sochi. She did this Dacha in Sochi, so if you sign that, I have some good authority. You sign that agreement, uh, and I will break every bone in your body. Yanukovych goes back and cancels the agreement. Huge eruption among, in some bits of Ukraine. How could he do this? How could he limit our relations with the West? Uh, so you look at this picture up here, you've got lots of EU flags and things flying and made down again. So here, it's not entirely clear, and seen from Moscow, what the, what the Russians see is a lot of ultra-Ukrainian nationalists out to overthrow what is, after all, the democratically elected president. This lady, Tori Newland, who's a friend of mine, really, uh, worked in the State Department at the time um, on, on Russia, turns up and dishes out cookies to the people who are demonstrating, it makes it very clear which side um, the United States stands on. Yanukovych, again, runs for it. That's what, he, what he's good at in, in political life. Um, uh, Putin again sees a huge humiliation in Ukraine popping up. He makes a speech in the um, from 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 the Kremlin, um, saying, "I've had enough of the United States. I've had enough of the West trampling all over Russia as if we don't matter, as if we cannot push back." And then what he does is he seizes Crimea. You remember Crimea, that little bit at the bottom, which was only handed over to Ukraine in um, 1954. Of, of close uh, sentimental interest to lots of Russians because their holiday homes are there, seizes Crimea and launches a, a, a small war, a war in the west of Ukraine, in the bit of Ukraine which is most oriented towards links with Russia. Um, okay, uh, that, that's a, there's a peace process, it's the Minsk peace process, September 2014, so there's Putin, there's Merkel from Germany, there's uh, the, the, the the, the Ukrainian president, that's Francois Hollande for reasons which are slightly mysterious to me. Um, so you've got in Ukraine now, this Crimea illegally seized, this is all, all illegal, and a war going on in, in, in Donbass. Now, let's quickly turn our attention to another part of the map, which is we're now in the period of highest when we're fighting um, uh, uh, ISIS in, in, in the Middle East, where Islamism in particular has become very strong. In the Caucasus, I was talking about Chechnya earlier, very large Muslim majorities in some of these places. Chechnya, 95% Muslim, Dagestan, 82% Muslim, and so on, and so on, and so on. And we reach the, um, the beginning of the school year in Russia in 2004. And um, the, 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 the beginning of the school year, all the kids come in, there's apple for the teacher, they sing the songs together. It's a, it's a great national celebration, isn't it? Except in Beslan in 2004, what happens is there's a big terrorist in, 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 incursion. Islamic terrorists seize the place, hold the children in siege for 200, uh, for, 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 for a week basically, until the Russian uh, army storms in and there's a big fight and 200 school kids die. And of course, you know, quite early in my ambassadorship, this happened just before I arrived there. I went, you, you can't not go and express your sympathies and all that. And what you're looking at there is the main hall of the school where um, uh, a lot of the fighting took place. And my person took me around there. And I went outside and we looked around the graves all on the outside in the main square of Beslan. And they had bottles of water on them. And I said, why the bottles of water? And the person showing me around said, you know, those terrorists did not let the children drink for the week that they were holding them. So, um, Putin, the Russian system, has a very scarred view of um, Islamism and what you allow and how you behave in the Middle East and the way to restrain it. Meanwhile, however, we in the West uh, are wandering around the, the, the Middle East, overthrowing local regimes, on the whole of which are then, are then replaced by rather, na rather nasty Islamist successors. So Mubarak fought in 2011, part of the Arab Spring, the, regime was elected to replace him, the so-called Muslim Brotherhood regime. Saddam, we fell in 2003, leaving a deeply chaotic situation behind us, um, and from which ISIS actually emerges. Gaddafi in 2011, saying we get rid of him and we leave chaos behind us, which actually prevails until this day. Putin, watching all this and watching our attention turning to Syria, which has actually lied to Russia, says, 
do you realize what you've done? It's a UN speech. Do you realize what you have done, O oh Western leaders? I am not going to let you do the same in Syria. Now, Syria, it has to be said, is run by a very nasty dictator, Bashar al-Assad. But nevertheless, in Putin's view, he, nasty though he may be, is vastly preferable to any sort of Islamist regime which might replace him. So here's the Russians arriving. This is Assad. Uh, this, is, this is how Islamism behaves. This is ISIS executing a whole load of people somewhere. Here's the, here are the Russians arriving, Russian Air Force arriving. The Russians are not, um, do, do not play softball when they go to war. They go in very heavily to make sure that Assad survives um, and then gets into a direct confrontation with us because we, in effect, are backing the opposition in Syria. Um, in effect, although we don't see it quite this way, are backing uh, the, the fundamentalists. Uh, and um, Putin is saying no, and is bombing the place flat. That's Aleppo in the middle there. That's um, a lovely city. I spent time in Beirut learning Arabic and then traveling to Aleppo. Beautiful, beautiful city. Now destroyed. Security Council up there. I think you recognize Boris when he was, when he was, our, when he was our foreign secretary, um, with the Russians systematically vetoing any resolution you might, you might offer forward. And a, a crucial moment in this, this thing pops up. That's um, an Iskander missile. And what the Russians do is they line up a row of these uh, in, in northern Russia for our satellites to photograph. Why? Because the Iskander missile is capable of carrying a nuclear warhead. This is the beginning of Russian, recurrent Russian threats to use nuclear weapons if we push them too far. And now we're in a sort of headlong spate of confrontations with the Russians running on through the US presidential election, the Russians interfere, there's lots of um, interference on the internet and all this. I don't think they actually changed the result. Putin would have taken some satisfaction that he saw Hillary Clinton off, who of course was the Democratic candidate, thus paying off the debt from the earlier, her earlier speech against him. But she, he does land us with, um, with Donald Trump. Um, there, there, there's all sorts of cyber attacks, including the so-called not picture, uh, the, the, the example of, of 20. 17, which closes down most of the NHS computer system by accident. And these things you can't control. Once, once the virus is out there, you can't control where it goes. This, of course, is Salisbury 2018, uh, the attack on, on Skripal and his wife, um, and the killing of, a, of another person by Russian agents carrying a, a, a nerve agent. We also introduced a lot of sanctions um, on high technology for Russia and so on. I'll come back to the issue of sanctions. I, I've said whenever anybody asks me, sanctions against Russia don't work. If, you, if you're a humble uh, functionary in, in, in the Kremlin and you go along to Putin and you say, sir, okay, we, we need to protect our, our national security, but if we do X, invade wherever it is, um, the, the West will introduce more sanctions and that will cause economic harm to our people. You will spend the rest of your career counting paper clips in Siberia. The Russian regime, Putin, but not only Putin, cares much more about Russia's security and pride than it does about the welfare of the Russian people. And that's a reality which we've had some difficulty adjusting to, but it, it is the reality. So we impose lots of sanctions and of course they don't work. A key side effect of all this is that Russia, loathed by the West, loathing the West, moves in the obvious direction of going through the circumstances, links up with Russia. The bond between Russia and China, links up with China. The bond between Russia and China goes stronger and stronger. There's Xi and Putin toasting themselves in the middle there. There's a very rise, a vast rising uh, level of trade between the two countries. I think China now accounts for more than half of Russian trade. There are joint military exercises. There's a couple of pipelines you know, stretching across Siberia, delivering Russian oil and gas to China. There's the UN Security Council where they now quite regularly jointly veto Western revolutions. So we're forming a bit of an, annex, an axis there already. And we find ourselves back in Ukraine. We're now 2021, a couple of years ago. Um, the Russian, well, what has happened, this map over here is again the expansion of NATO, the blue now is, change of color, uh, with uh, Western aspirations as to where this movement will go next. And there's Ukraine, bang in the middle, the yellow bit. A thousand, shed, uh, a thousand miles of frontier with Russia. Moving, we talked about the, the, the eastern boundary of Ukraine, moving the eastern boundary of Ukraine, again, 800 miles closer to Moscow. 
Moscow. And the country, as I've said, the country which the Russians care most, they view them as their Slavic brothers, all of that. And that really rather provokes Putin. And not only Putin, again, a lot of the people around him. Was my colleague in Russia at the time, a guy called Bill Burns, who's now head of the CIA, uh, wrote a telegram back to, a reporting telegram about, uh, back to Washington DC, which leaked in WikiLeaks, which said, I don't have the precise quotation, but said, every Russian I know, from the most liberal Western-minded Russian, to the, he describes as the knuckle-dragging, uh, most conservative, nastiest uh, inhabitants of, of Putin's uh, Kremlin. All of them are horrified at the thought of Ukraine joining NATO. And Putin, both because he feels it intensely himself, but also because quite a lot of Russians share his feeling, masses his troops on the, on the, on the side of Ukraine. We get into a rather pointless negotiation where um, Putin says, Ukraine's not going to join NATO, uh, is it? And Biden, very polite, says, well, you know, it's up to the Ukrainians, finally. And this is a fair point. The Ukrainians wanted to join NATO, want, still want to join NATO. Um, surely, we say, they should be for free to do that if that is what they want to do. And Putin's view very firmly is whatever the hell they want to do, this is a major threat to Russian security. It's not going to happen. So 24th of February last year, they launched their invasion, which is a disaster, actually, initially. They, they, they sweep in there. They expect Ukraine to collapse. They expect the eastern half of Ukraine, you remember, to fall into their arms. None of that happens. Um, well, here we are, what went wrong. The Ukraine, Ukrainians find, slightly unexpectedly, that Zelensky, their president, was a brilliant wartime president, pulling the country together, in getting arms out of the West, um, in standing up to the Russians, the Russian army, in any case, not with corruption and incompetence, so, but is seen off, is pushed back. Um, there are talks at the time, they don't go very far. It is said, uh, well, the Americans have admitted this, because the Americans kill them off and say, no, we just let the Russians be defeated. That's a very good thing for mankind. Uh, and we proceed to supply, that's this thing down the bottom here, it's like the high mask, the Ukrainians with masses of weapons, with masses of support, with masses of money, and say, get on with it. You know, see them off. It's time somebody dealt effectively with Russia. And it kind of worked for a while, but um, ran out of steam, frankly, because that's was how it started. So Russia started off that rather little group, red bit there in the east of Ukraine. By the end, or sort of, no, by the beginning, by the end of 2022, they occupied both the yellow and the red and the pink bits there. Um, but the, then there was a great Ukrainian counteroffensive, which threw them out of all of the yellow bits. They still end up running in control of about 20% of Ukraine, including, of course, Crimea, appalling atrocities committed by the Russians, which are a large part of everybody's feeling that we fight this until we win. We fight this until Ukraine gets everything back. And Zelensky's peace terms are Russians out of everywhere, reparations from, 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 from Russia, um, and war crimes trials for what happened in Bucha and elsewhere in Ukraine. So a set of terms which sound very reasonable and sensible to our Western ears, but do not sound in the least bit reasonable and sensible to Putin and the people around him. But then, they having made this, this huge advance, uh, they're stopped. And where we are now, I mean, very successful first Ukrainian counteroffensive late last year, uh, hopes this year, this uh, spring and summer, that the Ukrainians would repeat it, and they rather anticipated taking, you know, getting to the Crimea, not occupying Crimea, but they got stuck, and they are now stuck now. The whole thing has bogged down completely in terms of the fighting. You ask any, I'm not a military person, but you ask a military person what it feels like, and you will say the First World War, where after we spent four years in trenches, moving 100 yards one way or the other, at huge costs in lives as the war proceeded. And that's how it feels now. So the war has bogged down now. We imposed, I mean, the, the sanctions package is enormous. It's the biggest sanctions package ever imposed by anyone on anyone. Um, I'm not going to go through all of this, except to say it has been moderately successful. The ruble has collapsed. Um, the Russians now have a substitute for McDonald's, which is Russian-owned. Well, actually, maybe a Russian-owned substitute for McDonald's might be preferable. But anyway, um, you know, there, there's hardships of that sort. Uh, but the key thing about the sanctions is that they have not hit Russia really where it hurts. The aim was to make the ordinary Russian feel worse off and then rebel against Putin. 
Russian, the Russian economy actually continues to grow, as you can, as you can see down here, and actually continues to maintain an, an economic, a surplus on its trade. But they're growing faster than we are, I'd say with a certain amount of regret. Um, the, the, the trade, we've made all sorts of efforts to limit, in particular, Russian oil exports, which are the bigger than that, um, including saying we cannot let a Western company insure any sort of boat carrying Russian oil being sold above a certain price, whereupon, mysteriously, about a quarter of the world's tanker fleet vanished from everybody's maps. They're out there, presumably shipping Russian oil, without the West being involved and insured by God knows who. Um, and that sort of fissuring of the, the, of the world economic system has gone in all sorts of ways. Of course, we don't export chip, well, we don't export weapons to Russia, the North Koreans are. We don't export chips to the Russians. So what's happened is there's been a big surge of Russian buying of computer games. They've taken the chips out and put them into a way. Um, so it's, a, it's an object lesson in how very, very difficult it is to make sanctions bite against a country the size of Russia. And as, as far as the aim of sanctions goes, they have frankly been an abject failure. Russia, we've talked a bit about 1812, we've talked a bit about 1941. In both of those cases, the Russians pull together behind whoever's ruling them because they see the fatherland in danger. This is the messianic Russia. We're all in it together, standing up for our own destiny. So Putin's uh, popularity up and down, up and down, shoots up at the moment when he finds himself, when his country finds itself uh, facing uh, facing what they see uh, as a Western war against Russia. I think it's probably worth saying. I, of course, it's a war against Ukraine, and only Ukrainians are fighting on the Ukrainian side. But in Russian eyes, the Ukrainians are fighting on the back of Western intelligence, Western arms, Western money. We are, in effect, in their eyes, at war with them, except that it is not our soldiers who, who die, it is Ukrainian soldiers who die. That's going to be a very difficult mo moment to get over when and if the time comes. We in the West at least feel we have the advantage of moral standing. And Russians have, this is right, illegally invaded uh, another country, committed brutal atrocities while they've been there. Of course we're in the right, and of course the world will back us in this crusade against what Russia has done, which does not turn out to be entirely true. It's a map of the world's response to all of this. The blue bits are, if you like, the good guys. They're the, country, the countries who have rallied and supported sanctions and all that. And the, the grey and pink and, of course, red bits are the bits that haven't. And the sad fact is that about 80% of the human race, about half the world's economy, if you want to look at it that way, have said to passing Western negotiators, passing Western prime ministers, OK, you want us to introduce sanctions on Russia because they have illegally uh, invaded um, Ukraine. Why didn't you want us to do that when the United States illegally invaded Iraq? And we found ourselves in a, in a, in a, a real, with a real problem of consistency. And again, this is a point that I will come back to. We are the upholders of the so-called um, rules-based international order. And most of the world has started saying, but you're not upholding it. You'll uphold it in the case of Russia, but you won't uphold it against yourselves. That's a really worrying phenomenon that is emerging from this paragraph. Yes. Uh, Putin has taken a regular interest in saying, don't forget we're a nuclear power. Now, my military friends say he doesn't mean it, but he may mean it at some level. Um, but actually, nuclear weapons in this sort of war are useless. So I suspect that this is not an imminent threat that will be revealed to here. Um, but if I see the Ukrainians moving towards occupying Crimea in particular, dear to the Russian hearts, I think the temptation on Putin's part, even if he doesn't help him win the war, because a demonstration to the West how deadly serious he is, goes up. Now, I, I think the odds still remain very long of what's going to happen. But it is there as a sort of outside possible event. And in the, mean, in the middle of all this, of course, we've got a current uh, challenge, to put it mildly, in, in the Middle East, in Gaza. And the Israeli behavior, and I'll put my cards on the table here, with all the justifications they've got, the appalling Israeli behavior in Gaza. And again, our, our reaction to it. So we've got over here, the United States saying, yay, bash the Russians for how fully they're behaving. With regard to how the uh, Israelis are behaving in Gaza, we have remained very mute indeed. 
I just see, I mean, the Americans have actually moved faster than we have. They've started saying things like, we will sanction if necessary um, the, the settlers in, in the West Bank who are basically killing and brutalizing the local Palestinians there. We will sanction them if necessary, which is a strong thin thing for the United States to say. We have only just said the same thing yesterday. Um, uh, Cameron said it. We've been very slow, we've been very supine, I'm afraid, to react. And again, there's a consistency problem. We're very ready to go for the Russians and very unready, as far as I can see, to go, to go for the Israelis. And this has quite serious uh, implications in other ways. Suddenly it's become impossible for Congress to adopt an aid program for Ukraine. This is partly all about US politics, but it is partly about a growing feeling in the US. What are we doing there? Where is Ukraine anyway? Um, and, and, and a feeling in the, in the Republican Party, the majority in the House of Representatives, we should, you know, good, actually not, we've got better things to do with our money. We're already in massive deficit. We shouldn't be spending this sort of money at all, which is a, a problem for Ukraine. And it looms over a presidential election coming up in November next year, slightly less than a year from now, where you have the Democratic Party, you have Biden, committed to support Ukraine for as long as it takes. You have a Republican Party increasingly queasy about the sort of commitment that that's leading America into, and particularly if Trump turns up, the isolationist Trump is going to be a real problem. So I, I, I'm not, this is a long way off, the US presidential election is very hard to call. Uh, I, I live in, in the hope that somehow Donald Trump will vanish from the face of the earth, but you know, you never know. Um, but the Americans facing a very difficult choice, and actually it has to be said that US support for Ukraine as it, is, as it currently is, does not have widespread support among the, the, the public, so the, the US public. So there's a lot to watch there. Don't worry, I'm almost at the end. Um, the, well, various people quietly, including me, are looking for a way to establish ways of um, talking to, 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 to influential Russians, to finding a way that the two sides can be gotten together and give in to talk peace. And the deadlocked military situation uh, and all of that, and the offstage threat of nuclear war and all of that, um, and the huge destruction and killing which continues, there ought to be a market for some sort of talk to take place. There isn't yet. Um, the Zelensky in, in particular is very firmly on the line, we do not go into negotiations other than with the guarantee that we get all our territory back, which is a guarantee that the Russians are not going to give them. Um, and people are saying, I don't believe them, but people are saying Putin isn't ready to talk either. Now, I, I, I frankly don't believe that. I mean, the Russians are appallingly in the military. They've now stabilized the situation, but they've done very badly. This has real costs for them. I suspect that they would talk if they thought that would be useful. And they would probably settle, actually, for roughly speaking what they've got. I don't know. That's my guess. It's what I'm hearing to some extent. Um, but there's the possibility, and this possibility is increased by the current military deadlock, and the problem is getting money and arms to Ukraine, that a little bit of realism will come in and we'll, we'll get into a negotiation, which is obviously the right way for this thing to go. So, I mean, but it could go on. I mean, anybody could win. It could go on for years if what people are saying actually turns, in, turns into reality. There are a couple of very clear winners from all of this, even now. NATO has pulled together very effectively in support of the United States, in support of our hostility to what Russia has done. And NATO, which lots of people thought were on its last, was on its last legs, has actually demonstrated quite a, a, a capacity for vigor in its actions, which none of us really thought that it had. Um, the other winner, not so happily, is China. I and mean, the Russian economy has basically fallen into Chinese arms. You cannot buy a new foreign car in Russia now unless it's a Chinese car. You cannot sign on to a, a Wi-Fi network in, in, in Russia except a Chinese Wi-Fi network and so on and on and on. And however the war ends, Russia is going to be very much in China's pocket and part of China's assets as we go into the really serious Cold War, which is coming up, which is of course between the United States and China. And I'll just close you with this heartening picture. I think at the end, however the thing ends, we have landed ourselves with an angry bear. We've landed ourselves with Russia, which feels that the West has, uh, systematically humiliated it, betrayed it, set out to defeat it, operating in its closest, closest country. And that managing that going forward is going to be a pretty tricky process. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much for a wonderful uh, history <laughs> uh, talk to you. Um, and I'm delighted that to come into this because we can reach this obviously in this order in the book. And but it says very little about the role of the United Nations. Could it play any role with obviously the economy? That's right. Surely as someone who has been a UN ambassador in the talk, surely there must be discussions going on on well, discussions is overstating it, really. I mean, there are odd attempts by one side or the other to pass UN Security Council resolutions uh, criticizing the other side. Uh, and those resolutions are inevitably um, vetoed by whichever side is being attacked. And that's been the history since the beginning. And the Russians tried to get the, the Americans tried to get a Security Council resolution saying it's all illegal and the UN should rise up and do something about it. And of course, that didn't run. That then led to a General Assembly resolution, which actually passed. A, a large majority criticizing what the Russians have done. But in terms of the UN, the UN effectively intervening, that depends finally upon, the same is true in the Middle East actually, of, of, upon, upon the great powers, which in this context means Russia, China, well, it's the five permanent security council members, being a, a, agreeing on or at least being able to live with whatever language the security council comes up with. Now, if we do get into a negotiation and that negotiation does begin to produce um, some sort of agreed approach to peace, then at that point it becomes possible to contemplate the UN Security Council backing that process, backing the deal that's done, and that cements it into international law. But for the moment, I'm afraid, the UN is completely stymied. In a way, which is, I mean, I dealt with the UN, I said our UN department for a while while I was in the Foreign Office during the Cold War, and the UN in those days couldn't function for exactly the same reason. Every time we in the West came up with a suggested action by the Security Council, the Russians vetoed it and vice versa. Now, we've, we've just had glory, the UN has just had a glorious period, actually, between the end of the Cold War in 1991 and um, the sort of breakdown of re relations with, with China and so on, of, I mean, pick a date, 2010 and so on. In that period, it did fantastic work uh, in places like the Balkans and elsewhere. It's now reverted to its Cold War state of deadlock in the Security Council <laughs> and the inability to make any use of One of the strangest aspects of the war was the rise of empires from the I'm sorry, I, 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 I have an old man's ears. Oh, <laughs> I was asking about the um, involvement, which was one of the strangest aspects of it in the war. Well, the, the Wagner, the Wagner, the Wagner. Wagner. Oh, oh, yes. yes, no, German-speaking, Wagner, all right. <laughs> um, it was, it's very odd, really. Um, the Wagner group was actually quite useful to Russia for quite a long time, because it, it did things which the Russian government needed to disavow. It was quite active in, in, uh, in Africa. And when the war started, Prigozhin, who used to run it, um, so it made it make quite a significant contribution to the Russian military contribution, military action in um, in Ukraine, and it did make. I mean, the the the, um, the, the fall of my country remember the name of the town, Bakhmut. The fall of Bakhmut was essentially a Wagner achievement. And in the course of this, and Prigozhin was a wild, destructive, hooligan-type character. Actually, just Putin's type of guy. Putin likes military thugs. He's the sort of people who he believes should represent Russia most effectively in the outside world. Um, but in the course of this, Prigozhin reaches the conclusion, which does not lack basis, that the, the formal leadership of the Russian military effort, Shoigu, the defense minister, and Gerasimov, the chief of staff, are useless and should be gotten rid of. And <laughs> that is the background. I mean, mutiny is an overstatement. He gets a huge row with Shoigu and Gerasimov. 
And what happened, I can't remember the dates of it, but when the Wagner group sets off and it's more than pilgrimage, um, is he is out to, uh, to, to demonstrate to Putin that these people are useless and he should sack them. Now Putin's actually, it's an obvious reaction. Putin's reaction is, this is mutiny. Now there are lots of things you can do in Putin's book and get away with it. Now, if you're a crook, depends who you're stealing from. But, sort of thing. but mutiny is utterly, utterly unacceptable. And he, he makes a speech saying that. And then from then on, and, and I, I know Putin, I've seen quite a lot of Putin. He's very careful, very cautious, impossible to read, quite malevolent. I've seen him put down Gordon Brown and other British politicians. Even a flick of, he knows things that they don't. Um, anyway, Putin at this point says, well, okay, Mr. Bogosian, um, let's forget it. Let's move on. You know, you can move your operation to Belarus, that. which is, in retrospect, a total failure. While he prepares to finish Bogosian off, sets up to do that and then does it. Um, and the effect of that, well, so first of all, Wagner still exists and still doing stuff in Africa and so on under different leadership. Um, but secondly, the effect of that is that for the rest of the Russian leadership and the rest of the Russian military, you become even more cautious about setting yourself up against Putin. And let me add one other point here, which I should have said when I came up. There's a kind of assumption around in the West that the problem is Putin. Get rid of him and you know, we'll, we'll then have a peace negotiation, no doubt, and we'll all settle back to the cozy ways we related before. Um, that is wrong for two reasons. Firstly, it, this is not just Putin. What we are dealing with is Russia and a Russian leadership, which is very close. Um, I, I know these guys. These are people who've worked with Putin for the last 20, 30 years. They know each other backwards. They have a shared view, come back to something I said much earlier, of Russia's messianic standing in the international system and their determination not to let it go. So it's not just Putin. And the second point, which flows from the first, is that Putin fought under a bus tomorrow. What you're not going to get is a cuddly liberal. What you're going to get is a clone. Someone from the intelligence agencies or the nationalized industries or the military will take up the presidency uh, and will essentially continue Russian policies. I mean, they, they may have, if Russians have privately decided it's time to the end, then they give them an opportunity to go ahead with that. Um, but do not expect a, a lovable Russia, certainly within my lifetime, uh, Maybe within some of the rules. Uh, I've got a question. What do you think of the uh, blowing up of Nord Stream 2 in the Africa? This is very well. I mean, first of all, I'd, I'd, I'd like to say this in the face of a lot of lunatic press coverage. This was obviously the Ukrainian, and evidence of that has emerged. And you've got to give credit to Ukrainians. They, they've got a very, very slick intelligence operation which is capable of doing so. They can't admit to it because what they've blown up is largely a German ambassador, um, which doesn't therefore ingratiate them with the Germans and other other um, I don't think it makes a lot of material difference because nothing is going through it anyway. And the way the whole sanctions picture is developing, nothing's going to flow, flow through it for, for a long time to come. But the third point I would make, to come back to a point I made in connection with the Georgia war, is be very cautious about leaving what you read in the Western press. The unanimous Western press reaction was it was the Russians who did it, obviously. And I was wondering around people I know, people I respect them, why would they blow up their own pipeline? I was getting all sorts of weird explanations. Well, they blow up their own pipeline and obviously they can blow up other pipelines. Do you really do that? You can blow up other pipelines and want to, then you do it. You don't need to blow up an obviously. <coughs> and Quite how that story is spread, well, I can imagine that it's what those intelligence people and other people, a press which is instinctively hostile, for good reasons to Russia, to pick up on that story and run with it, and it was completely false. One thing we have to take in is what is the role of Belarus in this? What is the role of Belarus? Belarus. Belarus. How used to be Belarus to Russia? Who is the gang that is soil? How much of a threat would that be to building that part of the world? Yeah, no, it would be blown without doubt. 
um, because Belarus covers a very central portion of the, of the Russian Russian border up there in the north. And um, you know, if the Russian it, it stretches the Russian military, who already stretch pretty thin, even further if Belarus switches over to the western side, which is why Putin has put a lot of effort and money and propaganda and all that into Belarus to keep the thing going the way it is. And Belarus feels as no doubt to you, to me, unstable over a medium term. But for precisely the reason I've just given you, in the short term, they're going to be ready and the Russians are going to be ready to support, support them and maintain a pretty, a lid pretty tightly screwed down on Belarus. Uh, thank you for the talk, Megan. There's one point that I have to suggest to you. And that is the ownership of the oil. We have seen many countries around the world who have sitting on top of a pile of oil and strangely enough, they're not done by governments but by regimes. And many of them have seen them wiped out, maybe the union leaders. Uh, to make the people that uh, uh, take over much more friendly towards having the oil more under the control of the Western oil community. And Russia, of course, is one of those people who supply a whole lot of oil, which the oil majors would actually like that control. That's the question I have to you. Do you think that is the fact? Yeah, no, it is the case. I mean, I, one of the key jobs. I thought I was going to have when I went to Russia as ambassador in whenever it was 2004. Um, we at that time, the UK, were the largest Western investor in Russia because both Shell and BP had massive, massive investments in the Russian oil sector. Um, and as long as relations were good, um, you know that that worked reasonably well because Russia derived huge. But what they brought to Russia. Advanced technology that the Russians didn't have, advanced management techniques that the Russians didn't have. Uh, Shell, in particular, went into a ghastly island called Sakhalin, just off 